Good evening, everyone. Glad you could join us tonight. We have our full panel this evening. Uh, tonight we're going to discuss uh, uh, how we should be examining ourselves in, uh, in ahead of the of Passover. So that's our topic for this evening. Sit back and enjoy. Have yourself a nice cup of tea or coffee and uh, enjoy uh, line upon line. <laughs> Hey, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good to see everyone. If I can change this so I can see everyone. There we go. Well, you want to kick it off? <laughs> I want to kick it off with another corny story just to get us off there. in a light, friendly spirit. This is called Do You Know Your... Uh, the story is called, Do You Know Your Hymns? H-Y-M-N-S. The dentist hymn, crown him with many crowns. By the way, they make a fortune on those. The weatherman's hymn, there shall be showers of blessings. Showers of blessings. No, we won't see. The tailor's hymn, Holy. the politician standing on the promises. <laughs> <laughs> Optometrist him, open my eyes that I may see. Here's one that you will like if you think about it. The IRS agents him, sing, I surrender all. <laughs> the, the gossip, <laughs> pass it on. And, and for those who speed on the highway, here are just a few additional hymns. 55 miles per hour, God will take care of you. 75 miles per hour, nearer my God to thee. 85, mile, 85 <laughs> miles per hour, this world is not my home. That's a great song. <laughs> 95 miles an hour, Lord, I'm coming home. And 100 miles per hour, precious memories. <laughs> and oh, that's brilliant. By saying... Give me a sense of humor, Lord. Give me a grace to see a joke, to get some humor out of life, and pass it on to other folks. <laughs> okay, well, today... Uh, on that speeding thing, I'm not at the top, but I'm in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I'm in there. I'm not the 55-mile-an-hour guy like I should be. <laughs> no. I'm working on it sometimes. <laughs> um, well, we want to examine... How one becomes humble and appreciative of the love that God the Father and God the Son gave us with that tremendous sacrifice. And I really think the first place to start in the major scripture is 1 Corinthians 11. So I'm going to move to 1 Corinthians 11. We're going to pick it up in verse 17 and 18. 1 Corinthians 11, 17 and 18. Uh, and in that verse, Paul writes to the, to the church there, Corinth. He said, now in this that I declare of you, I praise you not that you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. In other words, you're going to church the way you're doing things. You're worse off. For first of all, when you come together in church, I hear that there um, be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Uh, and then he goes on to talk how some eat their supper or others have nothing to eat in their heresies. And really what it tells me about the Corinthian church at, when Paul wrote this letter, I think they later, Paul reformed them, but when it was later, that church was, was a tragic story of gluttony, drunkenness, class distinction, party spirit on the Passover, New Testament Passover evening because they neither had the proper respect or love for God, 
nor for their fellow brethren. And that's kind of a, a Paul makes it clear as we get to the end of this section. Uh, they brought curses upon themselves because of that terrible lack of self-examination before the New Testament Passover. Any comments before we go a little further? I think that's pretty obvious um, that when he wrote this, he was he was in a corrected uh, he was correcting them, and uh, if he was correcting them, that means that they had had lost their way on on some level. Yeah, gluttony, drunkenness, class distinction, all at the Passover of all places. Uh, and he says, you don't come there to eat your dinner. So we come there for those new symbols, which we'll get to, which most of us will be celebrating Sunday night of the bread and the wine. But we mentioned the symbolism last weekend. But I'm going to mention Job 42, 5, and 6, because the whole point of self-examination is to see yourself. And you remember as Job... Well, the thing about Job that's so interesting is that Job was a righteous man. God bragged about him to Satan. So obviously he was a good man, you know, better than we are. But Job still needed to examine himself and see himself. I want to just read this one little section out of Job 42.5. Here's what Job said. I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I abhor myself, repent in dust and ashes. Though Job was among the most righteous of all men, God finally allowed him to see himself, just like the Apostle Paul did in Romans 7. And when Job saw himself, his vanity was crushed. He repented. And I believe he grew in spiritual love like he took up quantum leap forward once he saw himself in comparison to God. Now obviously we're not as great as Job, but I think it's that kind of thing that God wants us to do every year before the New Testament Passover. But yep, that's absolutely. Pretty, that's very true. Um, I was thinking that uh, we probably would have been wise to have done the preparing for Passover maybe several weeks back to give people to, to time, have time to, to go through and to study through and, uh, and to examine themselves because it's uh, actually just a few days away now. But uh, hopefully people that have been in the church for some time know that and have been doing that. Yes, and, and next year, we'll, if we do this next year, we'll do it like, like you said, maybe like two weeks ahead of time. Um, but at least it's still not too late for anybody who hears this. They still have Saturday and at least till Sunday about 7 p.m. to get their mind in gear and their heart and soul. Yeah, and I think the first step on when you're going to examine yourself is probably when you, when you sit down and say, you know, I need, to, I need to think about myself. Maybe before you go one step further, pray and ask God to give you the wisdom to examine yourself, to be honest with yourself. Because, uh, you know, we willingly deceive ourselves. So maybe that would be a good time to ask God to say, gently help me with this. You know my strengths. <laughs> Don't crush me by opening the door and let me really look at myself. <laughs> you know? Yeah, maybe you can only take so much the first year. Right, right. But, but help me to do this and, and, and guide me. And I'm certain if you have a humble heart, he will do that. Yeah, the amount that you need to see this year, and then we can grow each year and seeing... I really think spiritual growth can be measured also in how honest you can read, be about yourself, strengths and weaknesses. You know, I think maturity means seeing the whole picture in balance, relative, of course, to God's high standards, needless to say. Um, and by the way, uh, you know, we're supposed to do this, as Paul said, in remembrance of him, uh, and First Corinthians 11 ties it down to that date uh, that that the disciples had the New Testament Passover on. And I think we need to remind people it's not about so much the personality of Jesus as the world perceives it. It's a connection to the Old Testament Passover, his life and his sacrificial service, because he had to be the perfect lamb, because he had to have a, a, a lamb that was blemish-free to be the lamb whose blood protected people from the death angel. And, you know, that's 
what, how we have to look at this whole thing is that Christ did that. And that is a fabulous thing that he conducted to be the lamb, to be the perfect sacrifice. And, you know, another way, another way to compare yourself is to read the scripture and say, and, and compare yourself to King David when he would, he would repent so deeply. Um, and compare yourself to uh, Abraham and to to the apostles and and to Christ Himself. Take a look and say, where am I like this person, or where am I not like these men? And start chipping away so that you do become more like they were. You know, and, and look at the just the statements they made, the questions they asked, the way that they stood up and and, and preached to false prophets or, or told Paul correcting people. Um, you know the way he did it, and um, and then look at his humble attitude. He said, "I die daily, but I'm not I'm not good enough to be an apostle. All the of all the apostles, I am least." So he was he was examining himself. I think a lot. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, Self examination uh, should probably is that effort should be ongoing. Maybe we should put more emphasis on it all throughout the year in order to be better prepared when the Passover is arriving. Yeah, it's like some sports teams, apparently they work at least quite a bit during the year to get ready for opening day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, we need a spring training for this. Yeah, they, they, and you think it's all done and, you know, they're ready that week, but they've been working for, well, anyway, for quite a while in, in the gym and whatever they do to get ready. It would be a good idea. Gary, would you like to read verse 23 to 28? And because and, that's really the meat of part of what we need to discuss. Sure. Uh, Corinthians 11, picking up in verse uh, 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat the bread and drink of the cup. You know, as I was looking at that, you know, well, go ahead, Gary. I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet for a minute. <laughs> Something just popped in my mind. I wanted to say, but uh, well, this this is just explaining in detail exactly uh, what we're doing here and why we're doing it, and uh, and how it came about. Uh, in my personal opinion, this is my favorite time of the year because this is so important and it's so solemn and it has so much meaning. I just uh, I look forward to it and I hope everyone has the understanding uh, in their hearts that makes them want to look forward to it the way that I do. It's uh, To me, it's just such a wonderful time. By the way, I, I was reading several writers who were saying that this is actually a positive you can get real negative and dour because you say, well, I'm unworthy. But obviously everybody's unworthy. Nobody's worthy. But you take it in a worthy manner. But we're worthy in the context in which I mean it because of the blood of Christ. You know, it's like that, that term, uh, the, the death angel passed over us when he saw the blood of the Messiah, which is, you know, Jesus Christ, the blood of the Lamb. So from God's perspective, he doesn't see our sins. He sees Christ's sacrifice. So in that context, when we do it appropriately, we are worthy. And it's a great thing to have our sins covered by Jesus Christ. It's a positive thing. I mean, we have to take it seriously, but it's a it's a wonderful thing. And, and they say sometimes maybe we get so solemn we forget, as you said, Gary, that it's a wonderful time of year. You know it. What you started to say, or what you were saying, puts me, uh, it makes me think of uh, that song Amazing Grace, uh, uh, John Newton, or Newman, Newton. and he, um, Newton, yeah, he, uh, you know, once he realized what he was and once he, what he had become, uh, I mean, he, he wrote that song, and 
just acknowledging the grace of God to allow us to do this, to allow us to be where we're at and to be able to uh, take in this uh, Passover. Yeah, when I think of that song, I think about the line where he says, what a wretch am I. Uh, a wretch, is, when you think about that, that's that's horrible. That's really horrible. That's what you do when you have... Uh, or in dry heaves, you're you're retching your 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 body is just trying to get rid of everything horrible, and uh, for him to 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 humble himself and to realize, and then to write this this song that's been sang a million millions of times, uh, and call himself a wretch shows such a repentant, humble uh, mind. Um, that that I, I'm looking at this and I think about. Uh, you know, you are what you eat, and Christ is saying, "Drink me in, eat, eat me, take me into you, become like me." Um, and I know that you, you know, I know that if I eat steak, I don't really become beef. But uh, the Christ is saying that you know, I want you to take this inside of you, in 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 your blood, and in your genes, and in your your DNA, and in your mind, and every piece of your body to become Christ-like. Because that's guaranteeing that you'll be with him for eternity if you can do that. And I think that this 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 passage of scriptures we're reading tonight really emphasizes that if you if you think about it. And yeah, exactly. It, it, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ken. Well, it's because what you said is right, and it leads up to a physical representation of of what has taken place spiritually, because he is in us. Uh, we're told, don't you know that you are, I mean, Christ is in you, you know, uh, that, that he is part of us, and that you know, nothing that we do that he doesn't know about. Um, I mean, it's just a physical representation of spiritual, what's happening spiritually, and the, the uh, creation of the new creature with uh, God's Holy Spirit. Well, the Passover, you know, the Passover is the tipping point in the entire story of creation and God creating human beings and everything. Because uh, up until that instant when the, that last drop of blood, of Jesus' blood, fell to the ground, mankind was condemned to death. But at that instant, we were saved. We, had, we, we gained the opportunity to become like God all in that instant, all at this time. That's why this, this particular day is so important, and, and I place so much emphasis on it. But, Ken, you know that uh, you mentioned that great song by John Newton, Amazing Grace. There is something special about that song. Every time I hear it, it grabs my attention, and I want to stop whatever I'm doing and listen to it all the way through. And just a few days ago uh, on PBS, the great Aretha Franklin did that song, almost a cappella, and it was just just soul stirring. It just grabs your heart and hangs on to it. I hope everybody gets the chance to see her do that because it's special. You know, the term Passover, it strikes me as something interesting. I had a lady uh, in my business today when she had a daughter. Her, her, her daughter's a sweet girl, but she's no supermodel. But this mother was bragging about how beautiful her daughter's legs are. And, uh, and, and I'm looking and seeing this little chunky girl that sweet as can be. God pass over. He he doesn't always look at, at the at the wretch in us. He I think he looks at us sometimes and just says that's my kid, you know. And that's the Passover is kind of those children in Egypt did not deserve to be passed over that night. They had become just like their captors, but he chose to look the other way for them. Um, and I think that the term Passover is, is, is a really neat term in that he just looks over that. He just passes over that and, and still continues to keep his promise to, rape, to Abraham in spite of us. Um, and so I think this is a time to be so thankful that God would pass over and just, just not look inside my house so much and give me a chance to overcome. Yeah, we're hidden under the blood of Christ, under the blood of the Lamb, which is a Passover symbolism. You know, when Christ was on the stake, being crucified at the very end, like you were saying, gave him the last drop of blood, dropped or, or enough that he, you know, uh, after they broke his leg, he, he gasped his last breath, and he said, it is finished, it is done. And the Father turned his back on Christ for just a second. He was left alone because he, was, he had our sin on him, he paid the price, and then, of course, that sin was covered by his blood, so we didn't see 
the um, so God, when he looks at us, he doesn't see our sin. Christ has paid that great price for us. I was thinking about one more thing in the section that Gary read. Uh, you know, on the same evening, it was that evening when Christ, um, by the way, Christ had no broken bones. He was, they broke the bones of the other guys and they threw a spear at his side. I meant to say that. I'm sorry about that. I, um, gotcha. <clears throat> I won't call it a senior moment. <laughs> Um, you all understood what I was trying to say, but when he when he when he mentions the same evening, he's connecting that event to the New Testament Passover evening, about 20 hours before you know Christ would die, uh, you know on the as, on the stake anyway die on the stake. But it but it also it pictures the comradeship that Christ and his disciples shared. And of course, we'll go through that reading John 13 through 18 uh, Sunday night. So when we do the the Passover, we're not just and we are celebrating his death and his body. But we're also celebrating a closeness, a comradeship with Christ and his disciples. We are kind of with them by extension of their writings, and it's like we're a comrade with our elder brother on the night of his betrayal. And that should be a close thing, like you know, like like pilots are going off into a death raid from a carrier at night, and they know that many of them won't come back alive. They usually drink a little small toast and kind of commit themselves to each other as they go off into the night, and many will die. That's sort of what what Christ felt toward his disciples that last evening, and we get to share that comradeship. That's a wonderful thing. I agree. He said, I, I have longed to eat this meal, this supper with you. He longed for this moment to, to be with them one last time. It's, it's heart-wrenching. And uh, when you read that, knowing that he knew, they didn't know. Uh, he knew what was coming. And for him to be able to sit down and eat that meal, uh, I don't know that I could swallow. I don't know. And he was so kind. He spared them from letting them fully understand what was going to happen to him the next day. Because I believe that they probably thought, that with all the miracles he did, that he would bring a legion of angels down uh, or something and destroy uh, destroy all the evil that was going on on the spot. And uh, he spared them the knowledge of that of what was coming then, and until the very day that it happened. Because, once again, he was loving and protecting these men um, so that they could see the true glory and power of God. And that we could read their writings today. Dave, would you read verse 28 through 32 of 1 Corinthians 11? And that's the next section we should discuss. And maybe in some ways, this is the great warning that Paul put to the Corinthian church. Yes. Uh, verse 28 A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the of the Lord and drinks he eats and drinks judgment upon himself. That is why let me try to stay on task here. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, uh, we are being dis uh, disciplined so that we may uh, not be condemned with the world. I got my little readers on. I'm trying to figure out where they're supposed to be. <laughs> so that's that's uh, third to thirty-two. By the way, the word uh, "examine" is "dakamezo" right. Greek. There it is. Do we lose him? No, no, I just didn't know if you were locked up or if you were uh, still out there. No, he's still there. Okay. I was just going to say, uh, according to these commentaries, it's, you know, checking metal to see if it's pure. It's approval. It's like the self-evaluation is like an inspection, inspecting attitude of heart. It's not all negative. It's more of a positive thing uh, so that you can possibly make the necessary changes that may have to be made after you inspect it. So this inspection is not just to beat up on ourselves, but 
so we can make some improvements. Um, and um, maybe I can show this little printout here, uh, and maybe Natalie can bring me the faith one in a minute. What you think of this? I have, a real, I have a quick question that a lot of people ask uh, this time of year. How do you? How do I know if I'm worthy? A lot of people. That's. I mean, they don't know if they should or shouldn't take the Passover. You're commanded to. Yes. You're commanded. No, to. no. I, I understand that, but they're, whether or not they're worthy, you know, the last verse, one of the last verses that was read was, "Make sure you don't do this unworthily," and that's a question a lot of people come up with. I don't, I don't know how another man could uh, could answer that question. It's, it, I think that's between them and God. They're going to another uh, uh, another sinning human being and asking that question. Uh, I just don't see as how uh, anyone would be qualified to answer it. Well, the 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 thing is, I think the key word is worthy manner. Let's let's face the obvious that if it were a matter of worthy, God would have gotten rid of many of us years ago, and we'd be the first to admit it. So um, they don't have to worry about being worthy or unworthy. It's taking it in a worthy manner. Uh, that means you have to take it seriously. Don't take it as a routine thing. You have to do self-examination. Um, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. I got this from another uh, article I read, but it was talking about self-discipline is much better than discipline. And, it's, and it was just using the example, if you had two boys, and one boy tried to behave himself, so I can read this carefully, if one, boy, one son tried to be dutiful and obedient and think about his behavior, and the other was a rebellious hellion pushing the envelope at every opportunity, it would come as no surprise that the, the troublesome son would, of course, suffer greater trials and greater severity, and the one who did self-discipline would spare himself. So, in other words, the, the value of examining yourself is that you can say to yourself, God, I realize in 2013 to 2014, I really didn't do so good. Self-examination. And I'm going to really try and do better. It's better for you to say that than for God to have to put you through a whole line of ringers to make you realize that you didn't do as well as you should have. Don't you think that's really at least part of the fruit of self-examination is to, to make a more accurate assessment of how you did the last year? But it's not a question of your being worthy. Everybody is equally unworthy. It's just the manner in which we take it. Well, also, if you, if you, you know, line upon line, if you go back to verse 17, who was he talking to? Uh, the people were doing this in an unworthy manner. I mean, they it turned into a party. And uh, so you have to look at yourself and say, in what manner am I going to do this? Am I going to do it humble and, and know that I'm not worthy and ask God to please one more time forgive me? Because remember, this is part of the forgiveness process is doing this. And the foot washing is renewing your baptism. And... Uh, so going in one, you know, every year and asking one more time, can you please be with me? Can you forgive me? Because I am weak, uh, and I'm a human being, and uh, you know, I I think that that creates a worthy manner. Yeah, I think if you're still asking, then you're on the right path. It's when you quit asking yourself, you know, it's you've you've you, you maybe not are not so. Yeah, when you don't care, that's a good point. As long as you care, you're on the right path. Yeah, I've always I've always thought that if I could uh, manage to get myself up to where I was, maybe I'm putting this a number, 65 or 70 percent worthy, then it was time for me to get on my knees and ask God to just beseech Him to please reach down and pull me in that last 30 or 40 percent, and He will. And one thing to remember. It's Christ's righteousness that makes us worthy. When God looks at our, you know, our history of sin the past year, He doesn't see it because it's covered under the blood of the Lamb. Just like the death angel that hit Egypt, all he saw, because the Egyptians, the the Egyptians had no lamb's blood on the doorposts of their homes. He saw their sins, 
but the, the Israelites were covered by the blood of the Lamb, so he didn't see it. God doesn't see our sin because we're under the blood of the Lamb. But he does want us to take it, as David said, not in a party atmosphere, routine atmosphere, or all those other negative things you could say. Take it in the right way. Um, um, appreciate the perfect Lamb. Uh, I got this from another analogy from another writer. I, I hope you all understand it. He said that when he go when he went attended sporting events, he noticed that the fans at professional golf tournaments were much more polite. They watched much more carefully and quietly. The fans at other events are screaming and acting crazy. Now some of that may be you know social economic, but he said there's a the difference in between the uh, golf fans and fans of other sports, the golf fans appreciated how difficult it was because the golf fans had all tried to make par in three shots on a difficult golf course. And they knew what it was like or to make a 30-foot putt because they had tried it and missed or tried to score under 90 on a really difficult. In other words, all the pro golf fans knew how hard it was. We need to appreciate how hard it was, not that Christ couldn't do it, but how hard it was for Christ to go sinless for 33 and a half years, to suffer a horrible crucifixion and betrayal and mocking, scourging, etc., and for God the Father to allow it. You know, God the Father could have said, that's enough, I'm going to send some angels and squash you, Pharisees <laughs> and Romans. So you know what I'm saying. It was hard for both of them. And I think God wants us to appreciate how hard it was for them. Yeah, you know what? That's yeah. I think that's exactly it. Is they the the people watching, the spectators, will appreciate how difficult it is because they're there. They, I mean, they've tried it. You know, we know how difficult it is not to sin, and we've got an example of someone who never did. So there are some extremes that people have to be aware of. It's extremes that I think can get you in trouble, and I'm trying to, to get my hand on the extremes that I think can be a problem for you. Um, if you're complacent, full of pride, um, you know, 2 Corinthians 10.12 says, um, well, I guess we we're going to discuss that one, judging ourselves among ourselves, because we're judging ourselves by each other. And that is not a good idea. And that's one of the extremes that people can get into. You know, you can also judge yourself by the expectations. You know, my father told me one time when I was well, little, he said the hardest thing for a, a man to learn is that his boy is just a, a boy. And the hardest thing for a boy to learn is that his father is just a man. And then I had my son, and I did my best to, to let him see what I wanted him to, you know, to, uh, to have this... For him to look at me like I was this special, wonderful, so he would, you know, hopefully better the family name, you know, get a little better. And uh, and I think God the Father has given us these examples trying to better us. So we should, we should think, what if I were a father over myself, what would I expect out of me as my own son? And I think that that would be a way to help us to kind of look forward, you know, what, what would I do in in, in public? What would I want the public to look at me and, and hear and, and see? Um, and so that's a way to examine yourself because is that who you really are? You know, I saw a billboard that said money does not corrupt a man. It simply exposes him. Who are you really? And that's what we've got to be asking ourselves. And if we find out we're not who we, who, who we should be, then you start chipping away at it and try to become who you're supposed to be. And the, the danger of judging yourself by each other is, okay, in your eyes you say, well, I'm better than so-and-so because he's got a more open problem than I do, and you don't think you have a lot to repent of, and that's a bad extreme, because we all know the standard that we should be judging ourselves by is not each other, but... Jesus. That's right. Jesus Christ, <laughs> God's standards. And, you know, if you look at other people, also one other thing to consider, every individual has a unique set of circumstances a unique set of challenges, a unique set of problems from his background, problems from his parents, grandparents, community, things that 
In other words, everybody is unique. So we can't really judge each other accurately because maybe God expects more from you. You may people like to think of it, but maybe you had advantages that, that other guy didn't have. Years and years ago, a guy said to me, he, there was a fellow, I don't know, he had some kind of a, a, I don't remember what it was, a handicap or something, a disability, and, and the, this fellow said, I don't like to be around for people like that. And I said, well, his problems are obvious. Yours are inside, and mine are too. Um, and that's something you got to think about. You know, what's going on inside your head, you never know what's going on inside someone's head. Uh, what they've gone through, their, what they've, their loss of jobs, money, loved ones, whatever. You don't know what brought that person to the position they're in. So we are unique, and I think that's a very good point. Um, and then we, but that's why we don't. I don't ask my wife to examine me. Uh, I look in the mirror and try to say, okay, who was I as a child? What did I expect out of myself? What did I expect out of my parents? And then try to become that guy. And you're not going to do it without obeying God. You're not going to do it without baptism, repentance, and keeping the holy days. But that will lead you there. Some of us may be a little quicker than others. In my case, it may have to drag me there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, you could argue that if you compare yourself and make a benchmark out of yourself, it could be idolatry, but even if it isn't idolatry, um, you could be aiming too low when it comes to intending to renew yourself because I think I'm better than so and so and so and so. So hey, God should be happy with me. I'm doing just fine, and that may not actually be true at all. You may be aiming too low by setting your standards, saying, "Well, I'm better than Bad Bob." Therefore, I have. Sounds nothing. like this well, Pharisees and Sadducees. Sounds exactly what their uh, attitude was. There is no biblical example of sins being rated anywhere. The least sin carries just as much guilt as the, the biggest sin. In the book of James, that's right. Uh, you have to be good. Then James, I forgot the way James worded it, but but you could be violent or you could be a liar, but either sin is equally will get you in trouble. It carries the same guilt. This may be one. Yeah, it says he who breaks the least of these is guilty of breaking all of them. Exactly. It's a package. It, yep. It's yep. a package. Mm -hmm. um, I want to just show this poster, if if it will show on the screen. If it doesn't, we can just tell you what it says. But uh, pull it back a little bit. It's too close to the camera. How's that? God doesn't expect us to be sinless. He expects us to a little bit higher, maybe to sin less. Got it. Now that's not not to take that as a justification to be bad. It's just that. When we come back in the Passover next year, I think God expects progress. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, I mean, that may be sound very pragmatic and not all that spectacular, but isn't that really what God wants? Is progress? I mean, real progress. That's what I expect. You know, when I teach my right. classes, I tell them, "Do you, do you have to get a, a lot better every class?" And some of them will go, yeah, I should get a lot better every class. I said, no, it's a work in progress. You get a little better, a little better, a little better. And then one day you look back, you're a lot better. And that's how, you know, that's why we have seven holy days. They keep us back on track because, you know, I'm, I'm like a, you know, a Rottweiler. I get off track real easy. And, and uh, you have to keep push nudging me back into place, you know. And I think the holy days are spaced out perfectly well. And what they teach us, the, represent, rep, the things they represent is the growing learning and changing process, the birthing process, if you will, to become part of the, a new family, God's family. Like next week we're going to talk about the symbolism of um, unleavened bread and the wave sheaf offering, which starts that count to 50 for Pentecost. And all that, I think, will help us to try to get better as we focus on being more unleavened. Think about the question the lady asked. What if she feels she's been totally unworthy, had a really bad year, went backwards, um, and some people have had a painful background, they were molested as a child, or they were verbally molested by their parents and siblings and kids and were told, you're worthless, or you're useless, or you're lazy, or whatever other pejoratives, 
And those are terrible experiences for young people, and they come into God's church feeling they're unworthy to take the Passover. Well, God commands us to take it. We're all unworthy. We just have to take it in a worthy manner and be aware that because of Jesus Christ, you are important and you're on your way to something much, much better. So try to forget all the negatives that you've had in your past. And I think that's an extreme that can mess people up. Going back, yeah, going back to what you said a couple of minutes ago about getting better every year, it's almost we're we're basically warriors. We're we're supposed to gain ground against Satan every chance we can, and continue. We don't fall back. We don't dig in. We try to gain ground and continually improve ourselves against Satan and sin as, as often as you know every day. And this is where we examine ourselves to see how much ground we've hopefully gained against him, because he's the one who's the one pushing this at us, the sin and our our weakness that allows it to happen. But we're basically in a war, in a battle, and we are. You know, that's our job. If you if you stand still, you're going backwards. That's yeah. right. Yeah, and usually that's the case. If a business says we're not growing, they're on their way down. They just don't know it yet. If you're not growing, you're on your way down. If By the you're way, not growing, you're retreating. <laughs> yeah. uh, the opposite of that one of feeling you're unworthy could be something like this. The opposite is that is like James 1 says, you look in the mirror. Like someone who looks in the, does a little self-evaluation, but he does it real quickly, um, like looking in the mirror and forgetting who you are. He does it so quickly. He says, oh, I'm fine, no, no problem. And he doesn't really think about it, put any time into thinking about it, and he takes it too lightly. It's like not looking in the mirror and seeing that you're all smudgy and dirty. Um, and we have to be careful of um, just say, oh, I'm just fine, I'm, I'm fine, I'm well. Even if you are doing better than somebody else, that may be good, but, that, but as we said before, it, it's God's standards that count. Um, so we have to be careful not to run through it too quickly. And there's another extreme that I've heard about, probably is not that often. Some people get so rigorous uh, in their self-exam, and they're just ripping, they're spinning all their self-exam, cutting themselves to pieces, but they get depressed. And it's almost like it's a, it's kind of an indulgence in self-destruction kind of like uh, masochism. And I really think that's not good because it says that you don't have faith in God, that God will take care of you and get you through. So this is another little poster that my wife made. And I, I hope you all can read that. I don't know if you can or not. A little higher. How's that look? That looks good. Faith. Full assurance in the heart. Full assurance in the heart. And I think in a way, we should have faith that, that if Christ chose you, he knows you can make it with the help, with his grace and the help of his, you know, Holy Spirit that he's going to give us. And we should not be too hard on ourselves. Now, I'm not saying don't say that, that you don't need to repent and do better. But I'm saying if someone is that extreme, masochistic, I'm going to cut myself up so much that I'll be too depressed to do anything. God doesn't want that. Satan loves people to be too depressed to do anything. Yeah, you know, he's the one He's the one usually causing that uh, feeling with people to help take them out of the game. My uh, youngest son was uh, down visiting, and he was, uh, you know, why are you down visiting? And he said, well, he's going to the high schools recruiting uh, ball players, And... Uh, he what he does is he watches them try out and play or whatever, and he says that one has that one has potential. I can work with that one. Why did he call you? Because you have potential. Because you can fill a spot he needs on his team. You, you he chose you for a reason. And you look around and there's some guy that's better looking or got more muscle or drives a nicer car or whatever. He, he chose him. So th that tells you something. You, you are special. He chose you for a reason. We don't know what that is. We don't need to know. 
Um, I'm sure when he gets, when my youngest one picks a guy for the team, this guy might be playing whatever now, but when he gets on that team, he's going to fill the position needed for the team. And all of us are team members, and we don't know why. We don't need to know why. We'll know why when we're doing it. And we just have got to look in the mirror and say, for whatever reason, he picked me. And so that means you're yeah, not. Go ahead. Go to the verse where it says not everyone can be an eye or a leg or an arm or it's it's exactly where that comes from. Yeah. You know, going back to uh, worthiness, uh, if you remember, Garner Ted wrote a booklet on I think it was entitled Guilt, and he emphasized how Satan uses guilt, and uh, that's exactly what he's doing here. He's beating you over the head with that when you when you doubt your worthiness. That's Satan coming at you and slapping you in the head. Laying that guilt upon you. I hope everybody can find that booklet and read it. Uh, it, it was uh, really spelled it out well. And, and God loves us. Um, we may not be the best of the world, as First Corinthians says. It doesn't matter. We're not many of the mighty or the great. We're the little people. But um, someday you'll, we'll find out, like they said, why He's called us. We just have faith that God will get us through. And as long as we take the Passover with self-examination and in a, you know, in a worthy manner, you know, in a respectful, appreciative manner, then God is happy with us, and that's what He wants. The devil wants us to get all depressed. Don't you wonder about some of these mass killings that the the people are depressed? I mean, a lot of them are teenagers or young men, and they kill a bunch of people. People say, "Well, I couldn't see why he did it." And I don't know if anybody, you know, mental illness is a tricky thing. But don't you wonder sometimes that the devil doesn't get people depressed and then he can twist them and do terrible things? Absolutely. You know, people will come to me and they'll, they'll tell me that they're having some kind of an issue. And I'll say to them, what can you do about that today? And if, if there's something you can do about it, go do it. And if you can't, then put that issue beside, be in, be in right, where you are right now, and do what you can do now for whatever needs to be done and then revisit that when you can do something about it. Can't do anything about what I did this morning. This morning's already gone. So I've got to let it stay this morning and have to be the new Dave now as I go forward. Um, if you if you examine yourself so much that you bring yourself back there, aren't you really back there? It's like the old Chinese adage, these, these two uh, Chinese monks were walking, they came to a river and there was a girl there and she had to get across and she was afraid. So the older monk picked her up and carried her across and sat her down. Well the younger monk walked around very disturbed about this and, and later on in the day the older older monk said, why are you upset? And he says, well we've taken a vow to never touch a female. And the older monk says, well I sat her down at the river, you're still carrying her. <laughs> we've got to look at our sin that way, Just let it go, it's done. Now go forward you know, set it down. That's a real good point. Set yeah. it down. Yep. Know that Christ sacrifices more than great enough to erase how horrible our sins were last year and, and in previous years. And even if we have a, we fall back a little bit. As long as, you, like you said, Ken, as long as you care, and God's spirit is still tugging on you. You're not out of the ball game. Come back and maybe have a great year this next coming year, a great Passover this year. You know, if God dying for you wasn't enough, uh, how special are you? If God himself sacrifices his son, God Jr., if you will, for you, what else could it, could you possibly need to for, for your forgiveness? I mean, uh, what's greater than that? And so if you can't, you can't just say, okay, you know what, he forgave me. That's done. Uh, it's time for you to follow that example and forgive yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've already got forgiveness from the top of the tower. Sorry. Yeah. Well, yeah. Ken, do you think we have pretty much exhausted the topic? And I believe we did. I believe you're correct. Well, James, I do have one question for you. Yes, sir. Uh, do you know how it is that the Indians came to this country before anyone else? Uh, I had reservations. Uh, they made reservations. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh, that's a good one. They made reservations. <laughs> By the way, All right. Just a little party <laughs> shot. <laughs> go, go ahead, doctor. 
Michigan's got its its full of reservations too. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, it does. All right. Well, we uh, we did uh, we ran the f uh, fifty minutes on this one, so we would like to thank everybody for watching. We really appreciate it. I know we're going to pick up another listener or two next week. They told me they were going to join us, so that'll be great. Um, I thank all you gentlemen for coming on tonight. I think we've pretty much uh, done a g good job of explaining to people um, how to examine yourself, how to know that uh, by examining yourself that uh, you are uh, you do need to take the Passover and Last Supper. So, uh, good night, gentlemen. Good night, Ken. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. And we'll be happy to see everyone next week.